Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we are live. Uh, welcome to Sailing Through Change, Understanding the Impact of uh, EU ETS. Uh, my name is Wojtek uh, Czolkowski, and uh, huge thanks to BS Group, Bridge to Success, uh, for organizing uh, that webinar. And a uh, huge uh, thank you to all of the speakers who are joining us today. today sorry. Thomas, uh, Dejin, Christy, Jacob, and Yuen, and then I will offer you a floor to introduce yourself in a sec. And also, a uh, huge thanks to uh, Zero North Coast Solution and uh, Vertis Finance for making that event uh, possible. So, my name is uh, Wojtek Czerkowski. I am uh, managing the partner at uh, CMI Blue Ocean, and I also work. Uh, as an executive coach at International Institute of Management Development in Lausanne. Delighted to be here. Uh, just briefly about my background, 25 years in physical shipping and 10 years in change management. I work with companies, especially in maritime context, helping them to embrace change and build a strategy to make the best out of it. And I am honored to be joined by distinguished speakers uh, perhaps uh, starting off with you, Thomas, if you could just uh, introduce your uh, background, company you're working for, and where you are in the context of EU ETS. Perfect. Thank you very much, Wojtek. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Thomas Heckman. I'm the uh, CCO with Code Solutions. Very quickly, what we deal with is basically sort of the foundation is uh, data collection and management, sort of validating data that can be both manual data or, or um, or uh, high frequency data and then utilizing that data for both uh, reporting but also forecasting consequences of uh, bunker consumption and emissions uh, being vessel performance primarily and uh, voyage optimization sort of very quickly uh, are the, the two main areas we use uh, the data for. Uh, my background is commercial shipping. Uh, as my reading glasses and color of my beard may indicate, I have uh, been more than 20 years in commercial shipping with uh, a background in Danish companies such as uh, AP Moller, uh, Norden, Afia, and others. Uh, and I've been with Coach for the past three years. Thank you so much. Uh, Jacob, over to you, perhaps, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, the company you work for and where you are. Uh, as far as the UETS context is concerned. Yeah, perfect. Thanks thanks a lot, Wojtek, and thanks for everyone organizing. So, so very quickly, so my name is Jacob Armstrong. I work for Transport and Environment. So we are an NGO, a not-for-profit, um, operating out of Brussels. And basically what we do is we, we try and push mainly the European institutions, but also uh, national governments in Europe, and also, of course, the IMO, to try and kind of produce policy um, to, to, to decarbonize shipping as quickly as possible. And so this is very much where we came in with the ETS is, is we've worked a long time on it to make sure it works best for shipping and works best for shipping deca decarbonization. So happy to speak a bit more about that in a second. Thanks very much. Uh, and perhaps over to you, Christy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Christia Asseli. I'm responsible for our product development in terms of emissions reporting and regulatory compliance at Zero North. Zero North is a Danish leading technology company which provides uh, different services for different stakeholders in the maritime sector with the goal of bringing together um, operators, owners, charterers, bunker suppliers on the same platform for making global trade green. And part of my role, I interact daily with uh, the UETS regulation, helping out the charterers and the owners simulating their exposure to the regulation, calculating and reporting and validating the data for their UHS exposure, as well as getting access to the EUAs on the carbon market. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dejin, over, who is based in Dubai, over to you, Dejin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this great session. So I uh, I working for Potty Stream, and basically we are a trading company, and basically 
we have a work for EU ETS based on owner's side and as well as, as charter side. Uh, we have a look through all the, uh, how can I say, uh, actual impact in the market. And I want to share those kind of uh, small experience over the last few months. And then and then my background is shipping analytics for many years. And I was analyst and I am, I am analyst uh, to determine, how can I say, where to go in terms of up and down. But obviously I want to understand the impact is my own, how can I say, uh, enthusiasm. So I'm really looking forward to learning from my uh, many other experts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, you went over to you. Thank you, Vatek, for this invitation. Um, so yeah, so my name is uh, Yuan Guillaume. Uh, I'm based in Brussels for, for Vertis Environmental and Finance, which is part of the STX group based in Amsterdam. Um, Vertis is uh, is focused on the on EU approaches or selling to all the industry and aviation on the like that have to comply with this EU ETS system. And as from uh, the 1st of January 2024, now all the shipping industry have to buy this EUAs. So uh, I'm part of this uh, of this group uh, since two years now. Uh, my background is shipping. I study shipping uh, and I have some experience as the owners at Pacific Basin, also at the charters at Total Energy and also at the broker at Beerus. So I bring this kind of um, insight of uh, how like the shipping industry and all, all, also this kind of uh, um, carbon uh, insight. So yeah, happy to be in this panel discussion. Uh, thank you so much. We are missing one more uh, participant, Varun Kumar from uh, TMA Balk, uh, who is representing owner's perspective. Unfortunately, he is unable to join us now, but hopefully all going well, he will join us in the next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, before we move on, I just wanted to share with everyone uh, a, a few things about the logistics of, of the session. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you are more than welcome to uh, pose your questions to, to the chat and the, the speakers will be happy to address them. And, uh, and also, we uh, are going to publish polls just to gauge the familiarity of, of, of everyone uh, with the UETS and, and the various aspects that we're going to, to dwell upon. Um, I think uh, for a good start, uh, if I could just ask the organizers to, to publish the poll on the degree of familiarity uh, with everyone, uh, that would be uh, great. I don't think that's the one. Uh, we probably want to publish the poll on uh, how familiar are you with the EU uh, emission trading system. So if you could uh, change the poll to the to the first one, that would be that would be great. Um, okay, just one sec because that popped out of my screen. Um, okay, so uh, before we move move on, I just wanted to share with you. The overall, the helicopter view of how we uh, plan out the session for today will take the change management perspective at it. You know, we'll look at this through the lens of SCQ framework. S stands for situation, C stands for challenge or complication, and then Q will be uh, uh, the question that we want to answer. So in other words, to put simply what's happening, why it matters, and uh, what it is that uh, each of you can do about it. And with that in mind, if I could ask perhaps Jacob, who is perhaps among all of us the closest to the regulators, he is based in Brussels, just to offer us a, a broad picture, big picture of what EU ETS is and uh, and then why it matters. Yeah, cheers, Wojtek. So, so see, I think that makes sense. So we've worked a lot with the and I think we've got the poll up as well, so that's good timing. Uh, so we've worked a lot with the kind of the political negotiations. That's really where we come into it. So maybe I'll just give that context of, of what is the ETS and what that means for, for kind of shipping. Um, so the ETS, the emissions trading system, has been in place since the early 2000s. Okay, it's really the EU's flagship um, climate tool, climate policy. Um, it covers roughly, it covers about 60% of all European emissions, all EU and, and EU 
PEA emissions. We're talking about a, a lot of emissions. And typically, we're talking about the big kind of industrial polluters. Okay, we're talking about steel, uh, steel factories, we're talking about coal plants, we're talking about, you know, big things like chemical industry, we're talking about stuff like this. Um, you know, the, the ETS has taken different phases, and every kind of phase, if you like, of about four, five, uh, six years, um, you have, there. there's a kind of revision process, and you get new industries come in, you get new rules. The whole kind of how the ETS works is that the EU, or the European Commission, through political negotiations, sets a total amount, a kind of cap of how much the EU economy or that the industries under the ETS are allowed to pollute. Um, then under that cap, basically it divides off all of those little kind of pollution, um, pollution permits into these kind of credits, what we call allowances. And each company typically has to buy an allowance or some of them they get for free. And then basically it has to decide based on the price of those allowances, whether it's better to actually keep keep buying the allowances and keep kind of trading things like this, or actually do some of the decarbonization work so they don't have to, um, so they're not liable for, for, for pollution. Now, in terms of the shipping question, shipping, the, the, the discussion about shipping decarbonization has, has happened also since about the early 2000s. Um, and really, I think the ball has kind of been, been knocking back and forth between the EU and the IMO even since then, right? Since the, the early 2000s, the EU did say it would put in place measures to decarbonize shipping if the IMO didn't act. Um, but it really has taken all of this time for the EU to actually get its game together to think about exactly what it can do and what it should do. And half or part of, of its response has been to put shipping into the ETS with all of these other sectors, right? It's not the full story. Maybe later on, we'll get into the other things that the EU is doing. Um, but this is really kind of the, the key thing, because it puts what we call the polluter pays principle into the shipping industry. Uh, it raises money, even more money, that can, some of which will go back into the sector for green projects and green, green, uh, green technologies, green fuels and things like this. And the last thing I'll say is that it does bridge it does kind of work to limit a little bit this gap between the price of, of of clean technologies and the price of dirty technologies which is really the key um aim of the ets so that's that's really kind of the the, the political context bit, bit behind the ets beautiful great thanks very much for that thomas if i could start with you because i i know that you all you, you not only have the service providers background which is your current role but you also as you mentioned you've worked as an owner for the last 20 years so I wonder if you could just narrow down, uh, you know, the big picture and, and, and set it in the context of why it is relevant from owner's perspective. Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to do so, or at least do my best. Um, and, and thank you very much. And I, um, and I would like to start by saying that, Jacob, if I say anything that sounds a little uh, negative, it's no way to undermine the efforts uh, and the, the purpose of EUTS, but it's not, it's not meant. I'm a huge fan of uh, regulations and regulating the industry. It's really needed uh, because shipping has been, uh, you know, obviously been proved for many years that we are unable to self-regulate, unfortunately. Uh, it's, been, it's been too fragmented a market and uh, it's been basically only driven by, by uh, monetary initiatives. So, so that being said, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Uh, you know, if you take sort of the helicopter view, there are two things you would look at from an owner's perspective as to what this has of uh, impact. There's the environmental impact, which is obviously the main motivator for initiatives like this. And then you have the operational impact or sort of the exposure, you could say, that this brings with you. Um, and given the, the, the talks we have with our clients and the owners I know, uh, you could say the immediate effect from an, uh, an environmental uh, view being that it's a local um, uh, regulatory in a global market is probably less than what you would desire it would be uh, because the market will continue to be driven by a high level of supply and demand. So where it may, um, it may result in sort of momentarily uh, swifts in bunker price versus market versus initiative to sail into EU or sail slower, uh, that will certainly happen, but again, that will distort the supply demand curve and that will again increase the market, will again undermine the initiatives for uh, decreasing a bunker and, uh, and CO2. Um, but that being said, that is what's happening right now. And I do think, uh, and of course, as the EU ETS becomes more and more expensive as the years go, the impact will be bigger and bigger. Uh, but, but right now, minimal impact, I would say, when it comes to sort of uh, overall uh, supply demand stories. And there's, of course, the incentive from an owner's point of view 
to uh, improve your assets from uh, a CO2 emitting uh, aspect. Um, and there I really think that, again, I mean, you could say, why wouldn't you as an owner uh, do everything you can to uh, to make sure that your asset emits as little CO2 as possible? Um, now, representing primarily the trample sector, I can say there are, there are several um, challenges in this. Um, one of them clearly being that often the DOC holder is not the uh, operational controller of the assets. Uh, that means that the initiative to improve your asset will need to be tied together with an underlying uh, ability to earn more money. Uh, otherwise, the initiative is not there. So if there's not a direct parallel between improving the asset and thereby increasing the value of that asset in the market, then the incentive is quite small. Uh, unfortunately, in shipping today, and it has been for many years, the way that the CPs are structured is that there are little to no incentive for ship owners to overperform. Uh, basically, uh, CP, uh, they are basically just as a stick that can hit you in the head if your vessel is underperforming. Uh, so having a vessel that is uh, really performing really, really well uh, should, in theory, uh, value or, or equal more money in the market. Unfortunately, uh, and how can I put this in a politically correct way, we, we, we are seeing owners that are maybe being slightly... Um, uh, a little optimistic when it comes to how to describe their assets in the market and tying that together with clauses that makes it virtually impossible to claim for underperformance. Um, it makes it extremely difficult. And this is where I think the real change will, will uh, happen because now we, if we then change that to the operational uh, change here, because overall what, what the EU ETS will drive is a clear change towards an absolute need for validated data and the ability to share that data openly. Because obviously, if you want to have your, your, uh, your credits and you want to be able to, to invoice people for that, then you will need validated data that has been verified by a verifying body that you can then submit, that you can all agree on, and you will then be able to, to get your money back in that way. And, and, um, and there's no way that um, this will drive a big change. And I think this is the biggest change from an owner's perspective is, is this operational change. And then also the... Um, of course, the risk picture, which, uh, you know, obviously, if this is a, a huge amount of money you'll need to pay in the future. Uh, so you better get sort of your ducks in a row when it comes to data. Otherwise, you are really putting yourself in a risky position. So, so these are sort of the overall things I would consider as an owner. That's that's the, the big dive. A lot, a lot to 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 unpack here. Before I uh, move on to Daisy, who I would like to uh, uh, ask to offer, you know, just a brief brief perspective from from charters uh, um, standpoint I just wanted to see whether we have the poll uh, closed what happened with the poll okay so we have so we actually have you know reasonably well informed audience 40 percent uh, of audience is very familiar uh, almost 40 percent somewhat familiar Neutral, 12%, not very familiar, only 12%, and not familiar at all, 1%. So that ups the challenge because it looks like we have a well-informed audience, so uh, so we have to up our game, which is great. Dejin, over to you. Uh, if you could just maybe before, with, without going into details, just a big uh, helicopter view of, of what it is EU ETS when it looks to Fertis. So basically, uh, uh, so we are basically trading freight uh, and also fertilizer as well. And then somehow when we do look into our perspective as charters and then who TC in the uh, ships and also dealing with the ship owners, it's a totally different view. We need to do that, but it's not really because of incentive or motivation. It's because of regulation. So it's a totally different view. And then basically the dollar point of view, it just uh, changes just one or two dollar, but we know it's going to be gradually impacting us. And then also it's part of, uh, we need to reporting it anyway, EUTS, not just for shipping, but also scope three perspective as well. And then uh, everything we need to consider, right? Uh, railway and storage, production, everything is reported, but now we need to report as shipping as well. So somehow this is the whole picture is part of the uh, game now. But uh, at this point, I totally agree with Thomas. At this point, there are not much incentive or motivation for ship owners to develop it, but 
we cannot say as a general point of view. Container sector, they are really now incentivized to you know uh, improving their asset by investing in the uh, alternative fuel. But on the other hand, some vessel who are not obligated to calling into Europe, they are really not uh, how can say want to uh, how can say investing in or maybe improve their asset. So there are two different gate because there are major incentives based on heavy pure consuming vessel, which is container. So, but, so from our point of view, it's basically when you pay container, it's just one box, it's a few bucks. It does not really change. But when you do the, let's say, a large vessel like Panamax vessel, you actually pay a lot of the bunker pure as well as associated carbon. And then when you come into next year and two years later, and then maybe carbon price going up much higher now around the sixty dollar, seventy dollar, it does not much change it. But if it's going up, it could be changing many things. So currently. I agree, totally agree with Thomas. It doesn't really look like incentivizing uh, initiative now, but yes, there are many initiatives for certain sector, starting from that. And also uh, as a regulatory uh, framework, every charter does need to comply with regulation. And that's why it's really impacting it. And I feel it's a positive for the future. Thanks very much for that. If, if I can switch off to uh, Christy, because you come from a similar angle that the Thomas yet it's different. What is ET, EU ETS when it comes to, to zero notice? How do you see that, you see yourself in, in that context? Thank you. So from our perspective, we will segment the industry in three categories. Obviously, we have the owners, we have the time charters, and we have the cargo owners. So the ones that will only have their cargo on board of the ships. And really, from an owner's perspective, again, the most important part is the regulatory compliance. How do we capture the data? How do we make sure that we are calculating our exposure to the EU ETS in a correct way? And then communicating on this EUA exposure with the charterers according to the charter party agreement. So it's true that the charter party agreement have not been a very useful tool, as Thomas was saying, when it comes to assessing um, and rewarding uh, ship owners that are investing in decarbonization. But the UHS has changed the nature of the CP clause. We're seeing owners requesting uh, the settlement of UAs to happen at the end of every month or at the end of every time charter uh, time period or at the end of a quarterly basis. So really the owners are working hand in hand with the charterers to collect the EUAs at the end of a certain uh, agreed upon time frame, either at the voyage level, time charter level, so on and so forth. And then you have the owners that operate in the uh, spot market. So we're really helping those owners simulate the UA exposure prefixture to the best of our ability from a high fuel model accuracy perspective so that they can bake in the price of the EUA exposure when they do the freight cost. When it comes to the charterers, I'll focus on the long-term time charters. What we've seen is that mostly time charters don't really care about the data quality of the vessel so much. Until now, with the UHS, the time mm -hmm. charter, I can tell you, are looking at every fuel consumption reported in every noon report because they want to make sure that the number they are calculating matches to what the owners are claiming in terms of EUA exposure. So the level of attention to having a good system in place for calculating and reporting and validating the data is unprecedented. And then on the cargo owner's perspective, uh, what we're helping uh, the cargo owners do is simulate their exposure to calculate the EUA cost prefixture, of course, but then also um, after the fixture to bake in the emissions into their scope three calculation. As Dejin was saying, scope three is growing in importance for cargo owners. So that's Zero North's role in that value chain. Super, thank you. Um... I think before I go to uh, to UN, or perhaps no, because we're going to publish another poll, uh, which is going to, uh, in a sense, uh, go deeper into the knowledge of EU ETS, but that's going to also be a, a test whether people are paying attention, because a lot of the uh, issues that will be addressed in that poll are, are, are is being addressed in your answers. But UN, you, you come from a somewhat different 
angle, uh, which is uh, I, I think super interesting. Could could you brief us on on how EU ETS sets in the context of what it is that you do and and, and Vertis Finance? Yes, thanks. Uh, I think we have like an interesting uh, discussion right now because when we look at the EU ETS at the beginning, it was mainly for the owners. They say like, okay, the owners will pay for this EU ways. And actually when the list of uh, EU was published on the 1st of February, all the name of the technical, I mean, at least the, the dog holder entity was listed. So now the dog holder entity are also looking even deeper on this kind of thing. But as we are, like, we are in, I'm, uh, at, least, at least in the shipping industry, oh, everybody is starting to, to ask us some questions because everybody want to buy e-waste right now. We have the charters, we have the banker traders, we have the commercial owners, owners, dog holders. So, I mean, I think the, at the moment, as we speak, the main important thing is to have at least a documentation on the CP, a contract, who is doing what. Because right now, for example, uh, I'm working with the owners that are buying EUS, that are buying EUS, and I'm also working with the charters that is also buying EUS. So if they do not discuss each other on who is doing what, I mean, they're going to buy EUS for the exact same wage. And this can be like kind of a, a risky situation. So, um, I mean, I just give you like kind of my point of view here that everybody now is looking at the EU ETS. I think there's some opportunities, uh, but also some challenge. And I think the discussion has to be made between all the parties. Uh, of course, um, it's easier for, for like owners to buy EUS because they are kind of, uh, as I said, Thomas, they are commercial owners. So they can definitely put that on the freight instead of the dog holder that would, uh, would just suffer to to invoice the owners and so on. And, and at the end, the charters will be responsible for buying this US based on the owners. Um, whether, I mean, you all know the bingo clause, but whether they can receive the invoice or whether it will be included on the freight. But um, this has, I mean, everybody has to look at that. Uh, but in general, I would say uh, a discussion is very important up front. Super, thanks. Before we move on, if I could just ask the uh, organizer to publish the next poll, which is, in your opinion, what is the primary goal of the UETS? Carbon reduction, economic incentives, regulatory compliance, market-driven emissions control, or others. And if you think it's others, then please specify. And let's see how that squares with uh, what we have uh, discussed so far. And uh, now if, if we could just uh, take this uh, conversation to the next level, maybe starting, uh, Jacob, uh, uh, with you, uh, how effective do you find that, that the regulation so far? Do you think it does the job for which it, 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 it was designed? Yeah, th thanks for taking. I think the discussion has already t t touched on this, and I think it, it really is a, an important point, right? Because because it, and it goes to the point of the poll, right? So which is you know what ex exactly is the ETS there to do? Uh, and I think it, you know I think it's it, it does a number of things, right? Um, what I said at the beginning is first of all this thing about the polluter pays principle, and because that just in general is really important, right? Again, taking a t step back, it is important that shipping companies which do pollute are are kind of are responsible as well for the costs of those pollution and those go back to states you know and then they go back to the public purse for things like hospitals and and, and, and schools and things of public services right so that kind of you know that that one very very general uh, concept is important to state then when you move into actually okay what is this achieving as i said really there is two things one it's it's um you know the theory is that it will it will bridge the gap just a little bit it will kind of push the price of a bunker fuel essentially up slightly and try to make um, those green fuels, those new fuels, slightly more uh, competitive. Now, realistically, because bunker fuels are so cheap and because the new fuels, which 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 aren't really there in great quantity yet, because the, the, the gap in the price of these two things are so high, it means the ETS, even at historically high prices, is not going to bridge that gap. OK, so that is something we, as even as a, an environmental NGO, we're, we're very clear with. And I think the point was raised initially as well is that for a number of reasons, you know, we're going to look It's um, the, the impact of the ETS is going to be quite limited now, partly because uh, we've got a phase in. 
right? Partly because shipping companies are, or shipping, uh, the shipping industry is not going to have to pay for the full cost, the full ETS cost just yet until 2026. And partly because the ETS cost, the ETS price is going to get higher over time. Because of those reasons, it means that we will have to wait a good number of years until we really, really see see the bite. Okay, and really see the the bite of that that climate legislation. The the two, the two last thing, as I'll say though, is that first of all, you know, that money going back to states is really important, and it is a good um, sign as well that states, the European Commission, uh, and others and other member states have actually signed up to give some of these revenues back to the shipping industry, right? So that's really to make these first new projects in some of, in terms of green technologies, in terms of green fuels you know, is literally get them on the water, right, is, is, is to get them going. That public guarantee is going to be really, really important. I think that's something stakeholders really need to think about and, and also work with governments to do, right, because because this is something as well that we've seen in our time of the negotiations is that the shipping industry typically hasn't had to deal too much uh, with governments and things like the European Commission, especially on climate issues. So this is a bit of a new animal, right, is is, is climate, is these new projects. So I think that's, that's one quite interesting thing. Um, um, but yeah, exactly. But so, so, so we'll see in a couple of years how the, um, how the ETS develops really. But, um, but yeah, f first thoughts there. Super. Thanks for that. Uh, let me close the poll here on, uh, and that's very interesting result. We see that, uh, almost half, half 45%, uh, of audience believes that the primary goal of the UETS is carbon reduction. Just over 20% believes it's about economic uh, incentives. Uh, just 10%, no, sorry, 8% the regulatory compliance. Uh, Market-driven emissions has been voted by 20, 28%. Um, hmm, it's interesting. Any reactions to that poll from, uh, from you guys, from the speakers? Thomas? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, basically, I think, uh, you know, um, what I think is very interesting, what Jacob says is that, you know, uh, you, you cannot, you know, judge the EU ETS from what's going on right now. You look, you need to look at it as a journey. And uh, as you also mentioned, uh, look at other initiatives that are being done sidelined with, um, with EU ETS. Uh, a great example would be the fuel EU uh, implemented next year that will drive into uh, and hopefully you know change this whole supply demand uh, hen and the egg question about getting the right fuels available and hopefully thereby create more fuel and thereby lower the prices of that and thereby increase the incentive to use different fuels and uh, brand we've uh, traditionally done and by then gradually increasing uh, the prices on on fuel oil will obviously then uh, increase the level of influence in, in, in how the market's going to trade forward. So I think that's, I'm very, uh, you know, I agree very much with what Jacob says. Uh, and, and that's why in, in general, you know, regardless of what the what the um, initiative is, is meant for, what it's doing, the fact is that it, it, is, will, it will be driving change. Um, and I think I very much agree with what Christy said. And what, what I also mentioned earlier is that I, I'm a huge fan of this immediate uh, need for validated data, because this is really what the what the industry has been lacking, sort of transparency and the ability to share information between stakeholders in a format that we can all trust and agree, and thereby use that to drive change. And I think that's the most uh, important thing uh, that we're really seeing a big change with on, on the uh, EU ETS. Chris, I see you, I, I see you nodding. I'm, I'm curious, how is, is that, uh, how is that resonating with you? Yes, uh, I agree with both Thomas and Jacob. I would just like to understand a bit better um, and what, how can we already say that we are reducing carbon from the atmosphere through the EUHS regulation? Because this is a statement that we cannot do. Like year on year, absolute CO2 emission is not going to get reduced just because we're starting to calculate EUA exposure and paying 58 or 60 euro per ton of co2 right like at the moment what the regulation is doing is creating economic incentives is making us take into account the cost of polluting as jacob says is creating transparency and data sharing but i can't really see how it's reducing year on year absolute co2 that is generated by the shipping industry as such the fuel EU regulation, of course, that's going to be totally different because it's going to change the underlying fuel consumption and the fuel mix of the industry, which ultimately that's how we calculate CO2. But the UHS regulation as such, um, 
yeah, I can't really see how it's uh, yeah being a dri driving reduction per se. Thank you, Daydream. So this is a very important perspective that we are just talking about shipping, right? Maybe we can reduce the bunker fuel or maybe fuel emission. But when you want to do that, the best way for ship owners or charters is slow down, basically speed slow down. But that is increasing the need of additional ships, which is emit a lot of carbon to build that ships. So it's a totally different aspect of the world, right? Uh, because you are want to saving the, how can you say, world, but you actually incentivizing building more vessel by using carbon, which is still intensive, and coal, as well as many labors as well. So that's why it's something very different. I can say it's a kind of regulatory compliance in EU, but then maybe reducing pure consumption or maybe, how can we say, carbon emission in Europe, but maybe increasing pure emission and then increasing carbon emission in Asia. So basically, it's now what happened for whatever we have heard a kind of a regulation and some kind of major drawbacks. But, but at this point, I really a big fan of a pure EU, which is basically incentivizing, right, the commercial incentivizing coal, alternative pure. Unless that is coming back, currently, all those regulations is actually incentivizing higher earning for ship owners and means incentivizing building more ships, which is emit much more higher uh, carbon emission. So that is something I want to point out that uh, basically at this point, there is something opposite view in terms of the whole perspective of uh, carbon emission. Interesting, interesting. I'll, I'll, I'd like to share a comment on that. But uh, before I do that, you and I'm curious, how is that uh, discussion, how is this discussion resonating with you in so far as effectiveness of UETS in your perspective? I mean, I think uh, today is kind of a historic day for, for the EU ETS because we, we just reached 50 euros uh, of the US price on the spot market. So when you look at uh, this year, I mean, last year, we are close to 100 euros. Today, we are at 50 euros. So you can imagine that normally the EU ETS is to reduce CO2 emission, but when the price of the US is only 50 euros, uh, I mean, some of the industry, uh, aviation, shipping industry would just say like, okay, I'm paying for this EUS and I'm not going to think about decarbonizing uh, like the ship or the, uh, the flight or whatever. So uh, right now, uh, I mean, it will not impact that much um, the, the, like the, the market, I would say. Uh, but of course, you have to think on a long term view because if you have to build a new vessel today, I mean, it will take time before it will be uh, at sea. So this is just like a, a little push for the industry to say, okay, now we have to decarbonize the shipping industry. So let's start all together. So, um, so I think that the EUHS is just like a little push, but I'll say Christy and all the panelists here, uh, the fuel EU will have the biggest impact on that. Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, just one second. We have a very interesting uh, question from the audience, quite technical, but before, before going uh, going to that question, I just wanted to share my personal, uh, I don't know, experience with, uh, well, not necessarily UETS, but the whole process of decarbonization when I launched this initiative uh, three and a half years ago when I spoke with the owners. Um, we're totally out of it. We're not paying attention to it. And I asked them what that business was about, about climate change decarbonization. Most of my clients were quite confused and actually wondered whether I wanted to take them for a demonstration with Greta Thunberg and uh, <laughs> totally, totally not paying attention. So I would say, yes, I mean, I, I, I second all the comments that uh, it is far from being imperfect. But the very fact that we have this webinar and the very fact that there is so much conversation in in private in public domain is, is 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 raising the awareness and you know you as they say you cannot change what you are unaware of uh and and perhaps as and when we get to fuel you uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be improved but let's just uh, before going any 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 further there is an interesting question and i'm curious whether um thomas or 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 christy could uh, could address that what data is used to calculate the, e, uh, the ETS liability for a particular ship? Where does the data come from? Christy, I see you raising your hand, please. 
So essentially, for those who are not familiar with the setup and the shipping industry, vessels report on what we call noon reports, which is essentially daily reports that the shipmaster need to fill that notify the shore team about the daily distance traveled, the daily fuel consumption per fuel grade, how much the main engine versus the auxiliary engine consume. So it's a very long report that is around uh, between 100 to 400 data fields per day that the crew on board needs to fill and submit to the shore team. There are new alternatives to that which are tied to high frequency data, capturing the data automatically, of course, but the industry very much still relies in general to the input provided by the master of the ship. So the data is reported on a daily basis, and then you have solution providers like Coach, like Zero North, that aggregate this data at the voyage level, at the annual level, that makes it ready for regulatory compliance. So I hope that answers the question. Very good. Thomas? Yeah, thanks, uh, Christian. If, if I may add, I mean, I think that the, uh, the challenge in the industry has been that you know these uh, reports from vessels. Uh, that is not a you know that is not a thing you you can choose or not to do. Uh, but the level of um, digitalization in these reports vary quite a lot from both sector to sector and owner to owner. And really, the the challenge has been to create uh, infrastructure in this data, i.e., shareable data and data sort of coming with with one truth. Uh, and, you know, giving the ability to look at data uh, coming from different sources and use it for the same purpose. And that means that what 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 we are really focusing on a lot right now is not necessarily forcing people to use coach uh, new report system, but rather having the pragmatic approach saying that I realize that no matter how much I would like the whole world to be client of coach, I need to be able to accept data from a variety of sources and then digest that data into an infrastructure where we can utilize that for the purpose that you then need. And that has really been the problem with data all along you know, from the big data questions. We've had a lot of data from a lot of different sources, but nobody has really been able to digest the data for the specific purpose that you have, uh, uh, you wanted to use this data for. And, and this is where I think we really see a big change in the market now that providers like, like ourselves needs to have the ability to digest data from a variety of stakeholders and systems and, and what have you and then use that data for the intended purpose for the clients. And in this instance here being EU ETS. And then of course we have all the verifiers uh, that will then eventually be able to stamp this uh, data at some point, uh, being able to uh, you know, send on an invoice for, for UAS or whatever it might be. But that, that's really the, the, the change. And I think um, we, we are still a far way in the industry from being ready for that sort of digitalization. But I have to say an, an, uh, an initiative like EUTS is really driving uh, the change here uh, in a tremendous speed. Uh, I mean, the, the interest we're seeing in validated data has been, I mean, it's, it's um, increased massively over the last year. So, um, so that, that's very interesting. Great. Would uh, anyone else would want to build on that? You and uh, Jacob? Yeah, I mean, I, I can just step in to respond to a, com a couple of those points. I mean, first of all, I think that's a really good sign, right? To, and again, to take the step back and think about exactly what the ETS is supposed to be doing, right? Um, it's, you know, it's supposed to be putting, you know, again, it's it's not perfect for the minute. It's not as, you know, the, the low ETS price. Let's not forget which comes from kind of quite particular circumstances, quite a warm winter, the European Commission trying to use some of the EUAs, trying to kind of release them back into the market to pay for things like renewable um, electricity generation in the wake of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, there, there are reasons behind that, right? But um, but in spite of the low price, you know, it is it is actually doing these things, right? So because data validation was uh, was one of a number of big market barriers, which meant that actually, um, you know, ships, ship operators, ship masters often weren't actually thinking about fuel consumption that much. Now this is changing, right? So that already that first step is massive. Okay, um, you know, and there's 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 lots more I could say about that as well. We hear a lot 
this um this kind of this this accusation that well you know we're only talking about european shipping here here and actually not only that you know we're actually only talking about 50 percent of emissions from voyages that between european and non-european ports so you know people tell us you know this is only going to affect a minority of global shipping but actually if you look at the data because of the nature of shipping because often a lot of shipping a lot of shipping segments a lot of uh, of companies don't actually know where they're going to end up throughout the year that it means that over the course of one year about 40 percent of the global fleet in terms of individual ship numbers call in 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 the european economic area okay 40 percent, which is already a lot if you look at that over five years so for example since the eu has started monitoring uh, shipping pollution you reach up to about 60 percent of the of the fleet still in operation today has called in the eu over the past five years right again that's massive right that means and that means opportunity that means you know all of these companies are going to need data validation they're going to need to start thinking about it um so that's already massive i wanted to say two things i want to say first of all even if we have a relatively low ets price and it is actually higher a lot higher than uh, than in the mid 2010s um i think one key thing we're forgetting here is 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 that energy efficiency is really important. Okay, so fuel sitch is, is another thing, going to be dealt with by uh, fuel U, which is really good. But there are so many energy efficiency solutions on the table already, which are actually quite economically uh, competitive without an ETS price, that I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see massive, massive, a massive boom in those technologies. So that's already great. And then the last thing I wanted to say was that actually to, 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 to go back to this question about slow steaming and the question of additional ships, what we see, and there's good, there's good, there's very good analysis that has been done on it, is because of the nation, the, the, the kind of, um, the relationship between fuel consumption and speed um, that if you do reduce your, your fuel consumption even needing more more ships in 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 the world means that the overall emissions are going to come down so CE Delft did a very good study on this which said that if all the ships in the world reduce their speed about 10 percent overall emissions would come down about 27 percent but needing the new ships um, would change this slightly but it would still mean the overall emissions would go down about 19%. Okay, so slow steaming does actually become interesting. And it means as well, that's really good because we're thinking about ETS is actually going to have a big impact on energy efficiency, as well as all of these other non, non kind of market barriers. So, so yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that. I can only uh, add to this, because I mean, just a second, what, what you've just mentioned, even you look at that from a practical perspective of taking a ship for anything that's longer than midterm, six months to 12 months or two years from a time chart, uh, a perspective. I mean, you really need to have the owner of the asset prepared to deal with this because it's impossible. The ship is not tradable if, 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 if she is not uh, effective when it comes to trading Europe. Um, if I could just uh, ask the organizer to perhaps uh, publish the poll that follows our previous uh, discussion in terms of uh, rate of effectiveness of the UETS in achieving carbon reduction goals, which kind of builds on what uh, what Jacob was uh, was saying, and let's let's see what the audience thinks and uh, building on on your comments. And now, uh, if we could just take uh, take the conversation and 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 look at this from what you individually identify as as key challenges i mean you partially address some of that but if we but if we could if we could just try to zero in for for the benefit of the audience where where do you see the challenges let's speak about the challenges first and then perhaps speak about the opportunities and then we move on to concrete actions that uh, can be taken uh, about it so who would like to take it on first Yeah, I, I, I will start. Um, I mean, just in terms of, of compliance, huh, because this is uh, the important thing. Of course, the compliance is September 2025 for the shipping industry. But all the vessels that started the voyage in January this year, uh, I mean, everything has to start to be calculated. So meaning that some owners, charters, as I said before, have to start to buying EUS right now. And the problem is uh, they need to like store or at least all this EUS somewhere. And this is, we call it like the more account, the maritime operator holding account. And at the moment, the bigger thing for like the ship owners, dock holder entity is to open their GAG account where they can hold and store this EUS. So right now, this difficulty is very here. I mean, before it was kind of easy for like a EU 
uh, company because they could have opened a GHG training account because they have a, an entity base in Europe. But uh, now that uh, um, all the, I mean, the, at least the list has been published, uh, we are, I mean, all the owners, the international owners are able to open their own account. But the problem here is like, uh, I mean, as you've seen in the list of, of for example, in Spain, a lot of um, doorholder entity has been listed in Spain. So if everybody start to to apply for this more account in Spain, I mean, it would take ages to, to get their account. So right now, there's some owners that want to buy EUS, but they cannot. At least, they, I mean, there's some alternative huh, to, to bypass that. But right now, in terms of compliance, because they will have to in their more account, they cannot open it right now. So that's why, I mean, there's different opportunities that we can discuss later, but this, I think, is the biggest challenge right now is to start buying EUAs and at least to store them, to start to, to comply. Because on the charter part, it's like on the, on the close, you can say like the, the charter has the responsibility to transfer this EUA to the owners, but the owners do not have the capacity to receive this EUA. And, and I think this is a, a, a big, big issue in this industry right now. Thanks for that. Uh... Great. So compliance, keyword as far as UN is concerned. Uh, Christy, when it comes to uh, working with uh, your clients, I mean, you partially addressed that, but let's just read. What do you see as the key challenge? I can honestly say that uh, we've seen a disbalance in between the charters and the owners. I, again, as Wen was mentioning now, we see the owners having to deal with their UHS for the first time, something as a trading account and a compliance account is completely new to them, whereas the charterers, on the other hand, have had the carbon desk for many years. They trade on carbon as a financial asset. They make a profit out of uh, UA trading. So they are well accustomed to trading on carbon, whereas the owners, on the other hand, they don't even have an account yet. So the level playing field has been very unequal when you look at how both uh, parties uh, manage their uh, EUHS carbon exposure. And this is something that is going to take some time to level up the owners in managing the carbon risk from a financial perspective. From a technological perspective and a compliance perspective, gathering, collecting, verifying the data, that's all fine. And we're getting up to speed with the owners on that. But in terms of deciding on when does the price of the EUAs get settled, when do I collect my EUAs, what makes most sense to include in my charter party agreement, those kinds of questions related to the financial nature of the regulation is this balance between the owners and the charterers. And I think it's something that was not well thought of on the Brussels side at the time of the regulation. Thanks very much uh, for that. Okay, uh, Thomas? Yeah, thanks. Um, and I, I don't disagree with anything that you just said there, Chrissy. On, on the other hand, I think actually that the owners are a little more resilient than we sometimes give them credit for, because I think basically, if you look at it, in the EUTS, uh, there's a lot of operational um, uh, technicalities involved in this in regards to having accounts and trade. But really, when we look at it, it's pretty straightforward. It's just an extra tax on, on fuel. And the ability to hedge and uh, hedge exposure, look at uh, forward needs when it comes to bunkers, uh, that, is not, uh, that is not strange for, for ship owners. So basically, this is just an extra dimension of whether you want to hedge your exposure going forward, depending on your trading profile, or whether or not you're fine playing the spot market. So do you want to buy hedge your bunkers, or do you want to be just buy it on the spot when you were, you know, and if we, we all know the bunker market can be extremely volatile, both on the general market, but also where in the world are you sourcing it? Um, so I think what, what we see is that basically the, the fear of, of sort of the inability to react fast enough from a technical point of view is not that big, even from small operators. Uh, and uh, they're pretty confident in sort of their strategy, will, which, which will often follow their strategy in bunker hedging. Uh, where you will often, if you have, if you have fixed your income, you'll fix your exposure. If you're playing the spot market, you also do that on the uh, exposure field. So, uh, I don't, I don't if, I can, if I can, if I can cut in, but because you mentioned, okay, so but so that is not a challenge. But from your perspective, what do you identify as the key challenge, though? Well, the key challenge is is, is quite simple for me. That's still to uh, 
to, to get the right data. It, it sounds extremely simple. Okay. Uh, and, and I think a lot of the bigger companies would sit and say, but we've had systems in place for this for, for quite some time. But we shouldn't underestimate that the operational profiles on companies that are dealing with the majority, especially in the tramper market, I agree with the agenda that on the container markets is different. But if you look on the tramper market, uh, you know, ships are changing hands from a daily basis. So agreeing on systems in place for having valid data and agreeing on the validity of this data and having agree on where we're getting it accredited, where we're getting it verified, how are we doing that? And that whole process team of data, that's the biggest challenge because okay. we haven't been used to agreeing on data to the same extent as we have to do now. Okay, so so because so I, I, I want to capture that. So, okay, so your, your, your key message, as you see the key challenge from your perspective is agreeing on data, Ewan's perspective is, uh, is, is compliance. And uh, Christy, you're raising your hand, please, please build on that and then help me try to capture because you mentioned, okay, as I, as I noted from your previous uh, comment that you see the disbalance between the, the charter's familiarity and owner's familiarity, as, as, as you mentioned, is one of the key challenges. Would, would you identify that as a key challenge? Or, or I mean, but perhaps before that, I, 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 you raise your hand, so you want to build on what Thomas mentioned. So we had a very interesting question from the audience about if do we see some uh, enough request for new models between owners and charters splitting the cost of um, solutions provider, right? So seeing charters and owners coming on the same platform to report the data and seeing eye to eye on that. And that's a great question because this was something that was completely unheard for uh, even a year ago when even CII didn't do this kind of uh, uh, change in relationship between owners and charters. So on the Zero North platform, what we're seeing is uh, charterers chartering ships from owners that are also on the Zero North platform and really facilitating um, that data communication and the framework under which owners and charterers communicate the data with each other is something that we're really seeing is becoming more and more the norm rather than the exception. And also, as Thomas was saying, integrating with class societies to make sure that this data gets verified by class at the source, which is at the data provider, is very important. So the whole landscape of collaboration in terms of data and verification has been one of the main positive thing about this regulation. Um, so that's not a challenge, actually. I just thought that it was a very interesting comment from um, a gentleman in the audience that was asking that. Okay, we'll get we'll get we'll get to the questions because there, there are quite a few of them uh, piled up. But I just want to uh, to uh, sort of like finish that that sequence. Dejin, if I may ask you, what do you see uh, as the key challenge as far as your operations are concerned? So uh, I've been to Miami for fertilizer conference. About one thousand people are joining, and all of them is basically fertilizer trader. And then we talk about EUTS because they want to understand EUTS, what's going on, and how much they pay. Once they heard it's about $2, they all <laughs> come out, basically. So what I mean is that uh, currently the acknowledgement of ship owner side and charter side, in terms of commercial incentive wise, it's not really, uh, how can you say, make any difference at this point. But on the other hand, many of them need to reporting it as a kind of a full scope of EUTS system. So recently, they also need to do CBAM as well, which is cross-border adjustment. So many things happen to in terms of compliance. And then for us, major challenge is we don't have one platform to cover everything. So I need to go all the way uh, to each person to see that. And that, that is a very big uh, challenge. And then I totally agree with Thomas that when we do void charter, it's very difficult to get the information about bundle consumption, but we need to report it. So time charter is fine, but so all those uh, guys uh, thing is basically it's not consistent uh, uh, across the regulation. That means we need to comply each of the regulation one by one. But I believe that this is still transitional step, but it need to be, how can I say, consistent, especially IMO, EUTS, whatever, we are seeing there are many uh, inconsistency. So that's why it's difficult to follow the regulation from charter's point of view. And there are not much incentive to follow in terms of commercial point of view. Great, uh, Jacob. Would would you want to close that? What's 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 the key challenge as far as you are concerned? On? 
Um, I mean, I mean, obviously from us, it's, it's, it's the kind of political layer. It's making sure we get the actual, the kind of the design of the thing right. And so for, from that, I'm kind of happy with the work I've done, we've done for the past three years. And I'm happy to let the industry now kind of soak it in and, and, and get, get ready for it. I mean, I think the point is that we have to make sure, and uh, this touches kind of everything, but we have to make sure that the the, the price signals are there, right? That the, the ETS does um, make, that does actually put into put into place those price signals right so that we have to get rid of all of the barriers possible to make sure that happens so that means if that's ma means making data available if that means um, making sure that the, the, the contracts um, make all of these relationships as efficient as possible that needs to be done right all of these things to make sure those price signals are actually there um, you know and there's there's a couple of things I'm not too worried about so for example this question of, of what's going to happen with the IMO you know and this is one of my favorite things to talk about is actually what we what we call the Brussels effect which is that and you you see this you know all, with, through so many different kind of things from gdpr to the to the new charges where where very often um european union um it, it's basically a regulatory superpower it can't really do anything else but it can do regulation so the regulations done at europe actually tend to kind of make a template for the rest of the world and we also see this between um between the sulfur directive so the eu put in the place the sulfur directive to reduce um, sulfur and maritime fuels basically the imo followed the eu's mrv the monitoring reporting and verification is, is was basically copied by the IMO for the data collection system. And so we're relatively confident that we're gonna have this same process. And at least even if there is gonna be differences between EU, IMO, and potentially other jurisdictions as well, right? But other other regions, the point is the reporting is more or less gonna be the same, you know, emissions data is emissions data. And you're just going to have to, to to comply with the highest kind of, the highest, uh, the highest, um, or the strictest kind of targets, which would probably be the EU, and then you'll comply with everyone else. So I think that would be fine. But it's just, as I say, over the next couple of years, as we see what happens to ETS in practice, we just need to make sure those price signals um, really, really uh, come into place in, in the market. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Before we go further, let me see if we have uh, polls closed. Uh, not. Uh, do you guys see the Q&A? Uh, are there any questions that you would want to perhaps take on? Uh, because there's quite a number of them, all of them, many of them are very interesting. So uh, if, if there is any one question that you feel strongly about, please feel free to, 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 to suggest um, and, and, and take it on before we go to the next uh, sequence, which is going to be very much about perhaps looking at that from a different perspective, that is to say, to identify opportunities, how, how that change can be transferred into an opportunity. And as far as organizers are concerned, can I, can I ask you to uh, uh, perhaps uh, publish the, the poll on how has your organization adopted to the EU ETS regulation? Could we? Okay, this is okay. There we go. So if you don't have any favorite questions, perhaps uh, let me, oops, all questions published, one sec. I think we did our homework well and been proactive in answering throughout the session. Oh. Right, one sec, closed. Okay, let's, uh, if, if, if I could suggest, because we have limited time, another 25 minutes only, could, could we take the conversation from, from the challenges to, to the opportunities? And then in the last sequence, we, 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 we try to identify what actually can be done, what, what would be the key takeaways for, for, for the audience. So what would be, if you look at this, compliance not necessarily as a as a burden to deal with but but an opportunity where, where would you identify the key opportunities are you and it sounds i mean it seems to me that you could be very much the right person to ask <laughs> this question 
it's kind of true, yeah. Uh, I mean, as I said before, uh, today the price of the US is close to, I mean, it's close to 50 euros. So uh, you have to think that you have to buy US for this compliance of 2024, but you will have to, you will have to buy US for 2005, 2006, and so on, until like you are probably like at zero percent CO2 emission limit. So meaning that if you are, if you know that you are going to emit CO2 in the next coming years. I mean, buying at that level, I think, can be like a very, very good entry point and start to accumulate some EUAs because you still have to keep in mind that uh, in EUA do not have any expiry. You can even buy it today and you can use it like in, in 2029 or even more. So this can be one, I would say, kind of opportunity right now is at least to, to keep like kind of a portfolio of EUAs that you can surrender at the later stage. Another thing is um, shipping industry is shipping. Uh, you are not going to speculate on this market. It's a new market. You don't know how it works. So I will not push you to speculate. But there are some players in industry, in aviation, that speculate. It means that they buy at 50, they sell at 60. When the market goes down to 50, they, they, they buy at 60 and so on. So there is still some money to be made here. Uh, I'm talking about like maybe small owners, medium owners that still have like a difficulty to pay for this EUA. If you're on top of this market, you can take the advantage of that. So this is kind of the two opportunity I can see right now in terms of trading. And also like <laughs> I can see that as we discussed before and last year, the, the EUA price was close to 100 euros. So some of the owners include on the freight uh, a price of 80, 90 euros um, the, the, for 1,000 EUAs. And, 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 and this means that right now, if they are buying this EUS today, they're going to buy at 50 euros. So they're going to make 30 euros difference. And this is a big, big uh, opportunity if like the owners are on top of the market and buy slow and just include everything on the freight and after the charter is paid for that. So I think this is the three opportunity I can see right now uh, based on the trading of, uh, of the EUS. Well, thanks very much for that. I think only strongly support your view because I mean, if you, unless you take a position that the climate change is universal, it's pretty much no brainer. Uh, Dejan, I wonder uh, how that resonates with you. I mean, if you right now, for example, had an opportunity to go long bunkers at three hundred dollars, with the bunkers today at six hundred, you will, as long as you operate, you will have to burn fuel. I'm, I'm curious how how your view of that resonates with you. I think uh, you are muted, I'm afraid. So uh, we, we really thought, thought about it, uh, how can I say, trading carbon uh, as well as, how can I say, banco itself. And then also when we conversate with the ship owners that when, how much we need to pay based on which date or is it daily plotting date or fixed rate or maybe certain date or will we pay later or maybe owner's expense. So, so many things we can talk about it. But if you can hatching it, obviously you will do that. But Problem at this point is it's not really scale of uh, hatching okay, amount. For uh, maybe very big uh, charters may have it, but for us it's just still small for each of the ship owners. But what we can do is that maybe we can do full point of view, right? Let's say one year uh, carbon uh, emission. We, maybe we can do that, but it takes a lot of financial risk, and then uh, also you need to reporting it to. <laughs> the expropriate laws in terms of the paper. So, so many things because it's not really understandable to very new player. I agree uh, with you that not many ship owners understand, not many chapters also understand what's going on. So, but but it is really uh, interesting that when FFA started like a, a few 10 or 20 years back, not many ship owners understand it, but almost every ship owner is doing that now. So, so basically, whenever you are hearing that there are some opportunity and that somebody earned the money, I think it will uh, bring the uh, very good opportunity, and especially the now it's fifty dollars, right? And then uh, we all know because of the lack of industry activity in Europe, and then gas price. That means there are very good opportunity to going up. But for me, it's a very good time. <laughs> to, but anyway, uh, whatsoever that means, a uh, big volatility could be very good opportunity for new okay, say market. Thank you. So, Thomas, may I ask you to put the owner's hat? since Varun has not been able to join us and, and, and perhaps share with us your perspective, looking at that through the vantage point of an owner, where would be the key opportunity for you? You're looking specifically at the UETS. Uh, well, I think for me, the key opportunity is definitely lies with owners that 
uh, has nothing to uh, to hide, so to speak, when it comes to vessel performance. Uh, because if you've had well-performing vessels, newer vessels, uh, really the, the the market incentive for having these vessels uh, well-performing has been very little. However, even though this is not a direct uh, consequence of EU ETS, you could say because you have to now share data that has been verified, validated. Um, that means that you can you can use the same data. Uh, for, for abstracting uh, vessel performance uh, models, meaning that it's going to be extremely difficult for owners that are being sort of less realistic about their performance level of vessels and their bunker consumption to, to um, let's, let's say it how it is, to hide this, uh, meaning that the incentive for basically showing the world how your, your data is and how your vessels are performing, that's a huge business opportunity that on a, on, a, on a different level is also driving a green transition uh, in the industry. Uh, and of course, that would be an advantage to some owner, uh, to others, uh, maybe a disadvantage, uh, or at least uh, an incentive to do something about their business model. <clears throat> so just to make sure that, that, that I got you right. So what you're saying is that the pressure, the regulatory pressure that comes on the back of EUTS for you, as you see it, from owner's perspective, is an opportunity to, I don't know, just get on the learning curve and then build a competitive advantage through... Well, it's gonna, it's gonna create a more transparent market as to how the vessels are performing. And that can be a, a, a competitive advantage, of course, depending on your fleet and uh, your trade right. and so forth. But I believe that basically um, very few people I speak to are against transparency, but it's a little bit the hen and the egg. Where is it gonna start? Who is gonna... It's a little bit, uh, you know, if you show me mine, I'll show you yours. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, and, and, and the regulatory is like this. It, it forces people into um, uh, treating data as it should be treated and also share it in, in, in uh, as it should be. So mm -hmm. it, I believe that's, it's, it's gonna, it's a bit of a side effect, you could say, to this whole EUTS uh, conversation. But it's a huge, uh, it's a huge step in the right direction for the industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christy. I, I see you nodding your 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 head. What, what, where do you see key opportunity interacting with your clients? I'll give my answer in uh, three folds. So first, really, the opportunity lies in innovation when it comes to innovative commercial agreements and ways of working between charterers and owners. So really, we see the opportunity to sit down rethink about the charter party clause, rethink about data sharing agreement and about how we settle the EUA exposure between charters and owners. So we can think about new business models and way of working between both parties. So that's really exciting, uh, if I can say. And then the second aspect is for charterers, it's an opportunity to measure more accurately data that they used to take lightly before. So recently, charterers have been more inclined into collecting data about their emissions for the sea cargo charterer, for example. But they haven't been very due diligent in verifying and scrutinizing how this data is collected and verified. So echoing again what Thomas has said, it's the opportunity to collect the data and hold it to the highest standard as it deserves. And then the third uh, opportunity is uh, for owners to put themselves in the best possible light. Why would you want to share data that uh, is coming uh, from your vessels, right? So really be transparent, show that you've invested in digital tools for collecting this data, show that you're willing to communicate with the charterer, and then you'll be positioned as a leader when it comes to sustainability, because at this point, we're not only talking about the E part of ESG, it also touches upon social and governance aspect of sustainability, because when you're willing to disclose data, when you're willing to enter in a communication and in a dialogue, you are positioning yourself in a sustainable business model. It's not only about the environmental part here, it's also about the governance aspect. So that I see is a very good opportunity for, for charterers and owners. Thanks. Jacob, before I turn to you, because there is a question kind of that touches on business models and what, you, what, uh, what you've just mentioned. And the question is, do any of the panelists see a new business model emerging where charters and owners share costs for a single GAG reporting tool and monthly slash voyage based pre-verification to avoid the EAU purchases during the year, do not tally with verified emissions at the end. 
by the conflicts. But uh, I don't know if, if any of you has any take on that. Christy? We've answered this in the previous section already. So uh, as I mentioned, that one of the, the, the attendees had a very interesting question about new business models and way of sharing okay, um, the cost. Yeah. Okay, Jacob, so then over to you on, on what you see the key opportunity. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. I mean, I think uh, what I'd say in a word is 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 to get ahead in terms of uh, emissions reduction. Okay, you do see quite a few and more and more companies actually investing in new technologies, investing in new fuels, with the realization, with the understanding that you know the ETS, as we've said, isn't going to be that hard hitting this year. But we've got fuel EU next year, and then we've got full ETS in 2026, and we've got higher prices from then on, right? And as we know, building new ships or investing in new technologies takes a lot of time. Um, so what's really important is shipping companies actually thinking think about getting ahead. And think that in the future, this uh, the the kind of yeah the, the the business model for these cleaner technologies is actually going to be much much stronger. Okay, so it's it's about uh, thinking ahead in terms of that, but also you know. It, also about thinking in terms of um, relationships with governments, right? Public funds as well, because because uh, the shipping industry is now within the kind of climate fold of the European Union and also member states. That means there is this relationship, right? And there is, we do see sensitivity from governments um, on the need to actually help out um, with some subsidy, subsidies for, for, for good, innovative green projects. So that's an opportunity, right? So if shipping companies can show that they're doing something quite interesting in terms of a new climate technology, and a lot of this, you know, to bring it back to the, to, to the point of, of Christian Thomas, a lot of these new technologies, the new ships do come with, you know, fully digitalized systems, or they do come with kind of innovative digitalized modules as well. This is all, you know, this is all, this is all good stuff that, 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 that shipping companies need to be talking with governments on. Um, so I think that's so really the point is, is it's an opportunity and people really need to start thinking, you know, five years, ahead, five, 10 years ahead, when all of these technologies are really going to be much more attractive. Yes, Thomas. It's a very, very good point, Jacob. And I think not even from a governmental point of view, but if you look at, you know, if you look outside the shipping market and, and basically looking at uh, financing your business model, attracting capital today is often going to be tied into uh, having some sort of uh, ESG model where you can prove uh, what you're doing as a company and and by going the right steps and investing in, in these sort of technologies and, and realizing that will be a great advantage for you as a company in the in, in, in regards to attracting capital, whether it's banks or capital funds or whatever it might be. So that's another huge opportunity that will uh, help you. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, let's see. There are a few more questions that I think have not been um, addressed. One is, and then before we go to key takeaways, but there is a, a question from Paul. Uh, what is becoming the standard in the owner's charters contract with respect to payment of ETS? Higher is paid up front. Bankers by the charters direct is anticipated ETS paid up front or at the end of the period. Christy. So it really depends on uh, what type of uh, contracts we're looking at. When it comes to the time charter market, we're seeing a majority of uh, agreements happening at the monthly level. So monthly settlement of EUAs or at the end of the time charter party. But when the time charter party period is long, it's on the monthly level. When it comes to the spot market, so voyage charter of vessels, the price of the EUAs is baked in as a cash settlement baked into the price of the freight prefixture. So we're not talking about EUA uh, transactions in the spot market. It's uh, baked into uh, cash form. Thank you. Um... Anyone would like to build on this before we move on to the next question? Yes. Yeah, even that, I mean, there's a lot of complexity in this now. We are even seeing people, you know, there's a difference in whether you want to settle it uh, from a, a dollar or euro perspective, but we're also seeing companies surrendering EUAs to each other, simply trading that themselves, but just surrendering the EUAs in question uh, instead of, you know, translating it. Dejan, you mentioned upon the complexity of agreeing to a price. I mean, that's a similar complexity as you're seeing in a time chart. You simply agree to a, a bunker price that's not necessarily reflecting how the bunker is in the market right now, but you need to agree to something. But we're also seeing companies simply, you know, handing over EUAs that they have traded themselves. Uh, maybe uh, uh, you and you can elaborate on that, but, you know, keeping the 
um, uh, the uh, economy of scale sort of that they can trade even more and simply control the trade and the handing over of EU rates and thereby control the price and, and do a lot more hedging and, and controlling in that way. I'm seeing some of the bigger traders doing that instead of just uh, yeah, yeah. settling at a price. You're totally, you're totally correct because, I mean, as, a, as you know, like the, the EUHS is sort of going industry for a long time. So some of the company in EU already trade EUS for some time. So what they do is they know that shipping is coming. They say like, okay. They already agree with the owners before that the regulation was already in place. They say, like, we're going to take care of that. No worries. We're going to serve, transfer, not surrender, but transfer this EU to your GAG account and you will surrender directly. So, definitely. Mm. So, that's why at the moment, owners, um, as I said before, owners, shutters, bank, everybody's buying US. So, that's why it's very important to make sure that everything is on writing. Because, I mean, it will be like the demerge late, late time or whatever. Uh, at the end, we're going to have some disputes. and people will have to argue. So always look at the city. Mm -hmm. Here's a, thank you for that. There's an interesting question that I think Jacob could be addressed to you because that has to do with honestly, policies uh, and, 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 and more a macro impact. Uh, could somebody explain how the EU ETS will uh, affect the position of EU industries compared to the industries from US, Middle East, Asia in terms of uh, a competitive perspective? Jacob, would you like to take on that? Yeah, yeah, I would. So, so when it comes to shipping, so this has been a live question, and this was quite a strong question throughout the the political process. Um, to resume, basically, that you know what this means in practice is is this question, okay, of having an EU shipping ETS. Does this mean um, EU EU ports? or EU shipping companies are going to lose out compared to non-EU ones, right? So first of all, on the question of EU com shipping companies, the, the, the very basic thing is no, because the, um, the legislation applies to all ships that call in Europe, regardless of flag, regardless of ownerships. So that means if you do business in Europe, no matter where you're from, you're going you're gonna to have to, 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 to deal with the ETS, okay? So that first question is, is kind of dealt with. Then there's this question about the ports, okay? And again, here, what we're, we're talking about is, is, you know, if coming to an EU port is more expensive, does that mean we're going to go, you know, to, to, to a British port, to a Turkish port, to a North African port? And we've actually done a lot of, a lot of, um, of work on this, and there's a couple of reasons why it's pretty clear that the European Commission agree. It's pretty clear it's not going to happen, right? And the, the basic point is that already coming to EU ports uh, means more regulation. Okay, that's what Europe's about. I've said it before, I said it again. And that means more costs for compliance. That means more costs. But the reason we still have, we still have trade is because Europeans pay more. Okay, so that's very simple. We have higher environmental and social standards, as so that means we pay more for goods and services that come into Europe. Um, so there's money to be made and it will be done. And I think um, the last really, really key point, and it has been touched upon already, is that in particular, if you look at the container industry, we've seen quite, cl quite clearly how they are going to handle um, the ETS cost, and that's through surcharges. Okay, so they're gonna, they've charged that all the the big container uh, carriers have said that they're gonna if you do business in Europe, um, you're gonna have to with with your box, you're gonna have to pay a little bit extra um, for the fact of coming to Europe because they're gonna have to deal with the ETS. And the point there, which we're looking into actually, and you can kind of save this for your diaries for a couple of weeks' time, is that it does seem like the container companies are not. It's not just a simple cost pass through exercise. But they make might, might make a little money on top of these surcharges too. Um, so the point there becomes: Why would any shipping company avoid coming to Europe if they're actually going to make money on it? In particular, on the container side. But the point very much here is that this is it's a complex debate. There's you're not going to go to a very far away port if you're going to have to carry something on a truck back to Europe. With trucks, you have to pay for tax on road tax anyway. It's pretty much impossible to go from North Africa or anywhere else to Europe on a truck equal with the UK. So it's a much more complex thing, but we're pretty clear that no, um, Europe is not going to lose business as a result of the ETS. Neijing, you are muted. You are muted. Neijing, you are muted. Okay, so I need to be devil's advocate about that, that one actually, <laughs> because I come from Asia, right? Uh, and then I mean, I see that uh, basically there are new regulations, CBAM. It's basically admit that there are disadvantage of this EUTS. Uh, I, I I think I should say that, right? So uh, basically, whatever you cost here it should be disadvantage, but because of the goodwill of the global, how to say, uh, initiative, this is a very good act. But we cannot, uh, how to say, uh, uh, 
uh, admit the ground that there are disability for the European customer or European. But anyway, it, it will be leading the global health initiative of carbon emission and then the carbon uh, agenda is really true. But it does not mean you are losing the uh, position. But it does not look like very big, uh, how to say, uh, how to say, uh, uh, disadvantage because you get a very good, how to say, uh, brand name as well as the uh, very good, how to say, position in terms of the leading the global, how to say, uh, decarbonization initiative. But on the other hand, there are indeed some kind of area we have seen that dairy market. I have uh, invited for dairy, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, association uh, event. Many of dairy market move away from US, uh, Europe because of this uh, EUTS system. So that kind of stuff is it's clearly happening. Uh, and then that is something uh, we are seeing that, but obviously on the other hand, there are many new technology industries sitting in the Europe. So that is basically uh, some area is uh, taking advantage, but certain area indeed taking disadvantage of what I've seen, seen so far. Thank you for that. Uh, we are just uh, six minutes away from uh, from the time, uh, so I just wanted to to perhaps share some of the posts that uh, we publish in the meantime, and then uh, offer you the floor to uh, for your for your key uh, uh, messages. Uh, and so uh, this poll is quite interesting. It's quite uh, optimistic. Uh, how has your organization adapted to the EU ETS regulations? Uh, 32% uh, voted that they've proactively embraced changes. 18% uh, moderate changes, no significant changes, 11%. Um, face challenges in adapting, just 12%. And 27% uh, uh, voted that uh, it was not applicable uh, to them. Uh, now, if may I then offer you an opportunity to each of you individually uh, just close with the key message uh, uh, to the audience and perhaps as and when you 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 offer that key message uh, maybe we can contextualize it and, and uh, maybe we can connect it to the challenges and opportunities that, that we discussed right the challenges and opportunities that you have identified if you could offer perhaps something that's actionable with respect to the challenge or opportunity that you have identified who who would like to start? Okay. Beijing. Okay, go ahead. So, <laughs> so what I have seen is that uh, across the industry, they have a very similar agenda in terms of sustainability and decarbonization, and that they all need to comply with many regulation in terms of the uh, environment regulation, and they have a shared exactly same uh, uh, how can say uh, vision that they will all want to reduce the carbon and to protect the uh, uh, world. But on the other hand, we all need to, how can I say, admit the starting ground, there are a sizable gap between the initial motivation and incentive of commercial view and, uh, against the, how can I say, the target. And there's something, many company announcing something, it's very far away from the actual practical, feasible, uh, working, uh, how can I say, uh, accurate assessment. So that's why uh, from uh, our perspective, EUTS is giving us very good ground, starting point, to assess what's going on now and then what is giving us in the future as well. So that's why I think this is something very important starting point and it will be uh, giving us a very good uh, I would say opportunity to grow uh, toward more decarbonization agenda. Okay, so the key that's message from you, still the big gap, but a good starting yes. point. And then you see it as, a, as an opportunity, I don't know, to build a competitive advantage perhaps. Uh, yes. Christy, over to you. What yes. Like to leave the audience with. There is clearly still room for improvement on the regulatory side. We all have our eyes on the IMO to adopt a global carbon tax or a fuel levy um, to, to, to really drive the decarbonization on a global scale. And also, all eyes are on fuel EU implementation ahead of next year. So there is really a room for uh, ma maneuvering in this regulatory space. So Jacob is not running out of work anytime soon. And then um, second is a, the data and digitalization. It went from being two very big buzzwords in the <laughs> recent years to really becoming something that we grasp and we all feel the need for and drive that there's a commercial drive behind that right now thanks to the UHS regulation so that's great 
And then lastly, again, on the positive note about rethinking the business model and the relationship between charter and owners, this is just the beginning of uh, a big change in the interaction between charters and owners for the better. And this is how we achieve sustainability is when we're able to align incentives across uh, different uh, stakeholders. So I'm more optimistic than pessimistic. Great, wonderful. Jacob, over to you. Yeah, I mean, just just quickly, I think I think I like what's just been said. You know, I think I think my message would be there is you know big green opportunity coming forth. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we talked a lot about green wave in terms of policy, in terms of regulation. It's kind of subsided a little bit, but it's going to come back, right? You know, we're going to have in a couple of years time, there's going to be a review process for the ETS with FuelU, and that means stricter legislation, right? So my message is really get in there early with these green projects, with these new uh, technologies, and and you know there will be payback basically. So, you know, big green opportunity. Awesome. Uh, uh, Yuen. Yeah, I mean, it's quite uh, true that uh, what mentioned Christy about like, uh, there's still room for improvement. And, and as you know, like the UTS is only for vessel above 5,000 GT. So we expect that uh, this threshold will reduce by to uh, vessel above 400 GT in 2027. So I think it's, it would be quite new for the shipping industry, but as you know, uh, all the all some all new subtopic in the shipping industry were well um, performed for the industry. So, um, I mean, if you suffer with this EU ETS, you are not the only one, and you have to take advantage of that. And you can use like all the kind of uh, consultancy company that can help you to drive this. Uh, the goal at the end is, is all to work together to to reduce the CO2 emission. And I have to be frank, at the end, it will be me that is going to pay for this EUT cost because it will follow the channel. <laughs> so the, the the product that I will buy in the supermarket will come from, I don't know, another country around the world and, and it will be part of the EUT. So, um, so no worries, we're all together. And let's hope uh, it will bring to, to zero CO2 emission in the future. Wonderful. We're on Swiss time. Thomas, if you make it in one minute, we're going to finish like Swiss uh, railway. I'll do it very quick. I have one clear message. Figure out how you want to collect validated data from your vessels, whether you're an operator, charter or owner. Figure out how you're going to get it verified, then you'll be fine. Whether we're talking forecasting or reporting, that's basically what you need to figure out. Awesome. Great. With that, I wanted to uh, thank the audience and uh, again thank uh, BS Group and uh, Zero North. Vertis and uh, Code Solutions uh, for, um, for 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 sponsoring that uh, that program and and to you guys uh, for your valuable insights and, and active participation. It's been uh, it's been a great discussion. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening to everyone. Likewise. Likewise. Thanks a lot.